I became really interested in geotechnical engineering in the last year of my university course. Uh, I was uh, doing an honours degree uh, specialising in structures and soil mechanics. I became really interested in geotechnical engineering in the last year of my university course. Uh, I was uh, doing an honours degree uh, specialising in structures and soil mechanics uh, and uh, Professor Ted Davis, my mentor, uh, inspired me really uh, to continue on doing geotechnical engineering. It was something that was quite intriguing because uh, there was an element of uncertainty in it which I really took to. Uh, instead of structures seemed to be very deterministic, uh, whereas there was a lot of uh, judgment involved in soil mechanics. And so I, I sort of uh, took that particular course uh, subsequently and did my uh, PhD in that area. And I, I worked on the use of elasticity in predicting foundation settlements and uh, I started off with shallow foundations and then moved on to deep foundations um, and I guess um, whatever contributions I've made that perhaps have been focused on the area of deep foundations and uh, their design and their behaviour. Victor de Mello was a major influence in my career, I have to say. I first met him, as I recall, way back in 1972 at a Southeast Asia Geotechnical Conference in Hong Kong. And uh, after that, I, uh, we interacted periodically. Uh, we had similar interests in, in terms of foundations. And he was, uh, in fact, uh, a, a great mentor at distance with some of the aspects of, of uh, deep foundations that I was interested in and I think I was particularly interested in the state-of-the-art report that he and others put together for the International Conference in Tokyo in 1977 and there he talked about power foundations. He referred to some of my work and of course it's always nice for a young academic to be referred uh, uh, by uh, one of the leading lights of, of our profession. I continued to see Victor many times. He visited Australia uh, during his presidency and was a, uh, a keynote speaker at an Australian New Zealand conference in Perth in 1984. Uh, we hosted him here and his late wife um, uh, for, for dinner and, and took him around Sydney. And subsequently, when I visited Brazil, I, I met him there. And I guess I was honoured uh, in his later years to be uh, one of his so-called three musketeers together with Professors Berlin and Yamilkovsky. So uh, we interacted and he was in the process of uh, actually writing a book when uh, unfortunately he, uh, he passed away. So he has been a major influence and supporter of my career. Difficult. I, I've been lucky to have been involved in a number of really interesting projects, but I suppose in terms of perhaps complexity and visibility, uh, the Burj Khalifa, uh, which started off being called the Burj Dubai, was really 
the projects that I, I guess, was the most challenging. It uh, was and still is, uh, at least for the time being, the world's tallest building. Uh, it was on calcareous uh, sediments, cemented calcareous sediments, so they were relatively weak. And we had a, a building that turned out to be 828 metres tall on uncertain foundations. But we went through, uh, and, and uh, I acted uh, with, with, as part of Coffees, who were the peer reviewers for Hyder, the then designers. And so we worked very closely together. Um, it was not a process where they did the design and then we checked it. We actually worked hand in hand and did almost parallel. Designs. And uh, there was quite a lot of in-situ testing, a lot of uh, uh, load testing of the foundation elements and a lot of advanced design, I think, uh, for the time. And uh, I guess every time I go to Dubai and look at that building, it's a certain sense of satisfaction that uh, I played some rather small part in that uh, particular project. This will be a very short summary, and I guess it will tax my memory. Um, I was concerned that um, many structural engineers now have access to complex uh, software for designing the structure and the foundation, but what they often don't incorporate is the interaction between different elements of the foundation. For example, uh, this pile affecting another pile, all the other piles in the system, the mat or, or raft foundation influencing the piles and vice versa. And so when you don't take account of those interactions, uh, you can seriously underestimate the settlement of the building uh, because the whole system is not as stiff as it would be if the elements didn't interact. So that's one aspect. Um, another aspect, uh, I guess, is that we tend to overlook the or, or ignore the contribution of the raft itself and that can be very influential in terms of providing extra stiffness and capacity and uh, there's been a number of studies done that indicate that if you take the raft into account you can economize uh, on the number of piles in the foundation system uh, and that reduces the cost and also importantly now it enhances the sustainability of the foundation system. So that's an important issue. Uh, I also talked about uh, the implicit assumption that we so often make that the raft is rigid uh, because uh, it may be in a normal pile cap, but if you've got an extensive pile graph system that spans 50 or 60 meters, the raft, even if it's relatively thick uh, in appearance, uh, is still uh, quite flexible. So that's another issue. We often tend to ignore the basement walls uh, as part of the foundation system and they can help to reduce the reinforcement requirements for the piles, particularly the piles near the outer edges. Um, we tend to ignore the, um, uh, the possible effects of ground movements due to such aspects as tunnelling in urban areas or excavations because when the ground moves, it interacts with existing piles and that can tend to overload the piles. And we have examples in uh, this city here in Sydney of cases where there's been an excavation that's had a detrimental effect on adjacent buildings. Um, I also uh, talked about the fact that when we design foundations for seismic uh, loading that we tend to only look at inertial effects, in other words, the effect of the structure loading the foundation system. We often overlook the fact that the ground itself is moving and so it's causing um, uh, effects because of that ground movement, uh, these so-called kinematic effects. So those sorts of things that I talked about. And finally, we also tend as geotechnical engineers to idealise the pile as an elastic member, but quite often, of course, uh, it's uh, a non-linear uh, member uh, and that can be important for lateral loading effects because it may, of course, crack and so become less stiff. Well, obviously, in terms of capacity, there is a difference between uplift and compression because you lose the, the base 
uh, capacity unless you've got an enlarged base. But there is also a fundamental difference, potentially, uh, in the skin friction uh, between uplift and compression uh, because of the so-called possum effect that when you load a pole downwards, it tends to expand outwards. And if you have a very stiff soil, uh, then that can actually enhance the lateral stresses on the pile and so increase the skin friction. Conversely, when you pull the pile upwards, the diameter tends to shrink a little bit and you lose the lateral pressure or you reduce the lateral pressure, don't lose it, uh, and so you get a reduced skin friction. And so, in general, the skin friction in uplift tends to be smaller than the skin friction in compression. Now, that's influenced by the length of the pile and the relative stiffness of the pile relative to the soil. The longer the pile, the more likely it is that you'll get a big difference. Uh, the stiffer the soil adjacent to the pile, uh, the more likely it is that you'll get a significant difference between uplift and compression. So these are things that one must always be on the lookout for. As a standard practice, we tend to reduce the skin friction when we're dealing with uplift by about 25 to 30 percent. It's hard to give a, a universal answer to that, but I, I think uh, there is still a significant gap between research and practice. This is something that, in fact, the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering is addressing, and uh, there is a, a group that's looking at uh, trying to reduce that gap. I think the problem is that much of our practice is still um, based on older style soil mechanics, conventional soil mechanics. Um, and that's fine, uh, but um, uh, there are some newer aspects now uh, where I think uh, practice has not caught up with research. And I think on the other hand, uh, too often research is focused on the very finer points which may make a few percent difference, but as far as a practitioner is concerned, it doesn't really matter because we have so many other aspects that um, are important, that some of those research aspects tend to be really insignificant. So um, I think there is a move now, certainly in international conferences, to try and understand and reduce the differences between uh, academic and practitioners. Not an easy question to answer today, but I, I think um, really um, we need to get away from some old uh, concepts that um, uh, when you use piles they need to be founded in rock, for example. There are many cases, and, and Shanghai of course is an outstanding case, where you, <laughs> you can't reach rock. You know, you've got hundreds of metres of soft soil and yet you support buildings of 600 or so metres. So it is possible to design deep foundations, but you've got to do it uh, in, a, in a proper way. Um, I think the other thing is that uh, we need to try and um, move away or modify empirical methods which have been in use for decades. Uh, because uh, as we learn more and more about uh, foundation behaviour, for example, as we have more measurements on how real foundations behave, the more uh, we can understand uh, the limitations of some of the uh, empirical methods that we're using. In the end, we're still faced with a major problem, uh, and that is characterisation of the ground. And I think um, uh, the more I, I go on in my career, the more I recognise that no matter how wonderful a computer program you have and how uh, cleverly you think you can test the soil, uh, if you don't characterise the soil mass uh, in a, a sensible and appropriate way, then you will not necessarily get the right sort of answer. So I, I think that really the big breakthrough that will come in traditional foundation engineering at least is trying to improve uh, the accuracy and reliability of our means of characterising the soil.
two or three things that I would suggest. The first is be aware and, and understand fully the fundamentals of soil mechanics and, and rock mechanics in particular. Certainly the effective stress uh, principle. Uh, even now, I mean, I encounter people that have been graduated for 30 or 40 years and still don't have a proper grasp of the fundamentals. And that uh, includes soil mechanics. It also includes engineering mechanics because we should understand that uh, if you have two materials of different or two elements of different stiffness, uh, that uh, the load distribution between them depends on their relative stiffness, for example. The next thing I would say to a young engineer is don't rush to the computer every time you have to solve a problem. Think about the mechanics. Uh, think about simple ways of representing the problem so that uh, without going to a computer, you can do a simple calculation and get an idea of the order of the answer that you're talking about. For example, the settlement of the building. Um, when you have that, then you go to the computer if you believe it's necessary uh, to get a more refined answer. Uh, remembering, of course, that um, uh, the simple answer may take um, uh, minutes or an hour or two to get. A computer analysis can take days. And in a commercial environment, if you rely on analyses that take days, uh, you may not be able to effectively do your job. So those are some of the things that I would recommend to younger people. Don't be sort of overwhelmed and entranced by uh, the abilities that we have to do numerical computation. Sometimes uh, you can get a long way with very simple.